Today is April 4th, 2017. My name is McKenna Boone with Gavin Swan interviewing second and Reagan Irvin interviewing last. Regina Stiltson is on camera. We are interviewing Jason Anderson, age 38, born on July 13th, 1978. Today for our project Next Generation Group at Harrisburg District Library in Harrisburg, Illinois. Thank you for coming to talk with us, Jake. Jason. To begin, where were you born? I was born here in Harrisburg. What was your childhood like? My childhood was is I lived here in Garden of the Gods, so I spent a lot of my time as pretty much an only child because my sister was 10 years older in the woods. So I was hunting and fishing, doing a lot of rock climbing and hiking. What are the names of your parents? My parents' names are Deneen and Carolyn. What were their career what were their careers? Well, they were both teachers. In fact, my mother was a fifth grade teacher for about twenty years. Did they inspire you to join the military? Mm, they didn't really inspire me to, but they didn't not support me when I decided to. Do you have any siblings? I have a sister. What are their names? Her name is Christy. Was anyone in your family in the military? My grandfather was. He served in World War II in the Pacific on the USS New Jersey, which was a battleship. Before you entered the military, what were you doing? I was going to college at SIU. How old were you when you entered the military? I was 19. In what branch of the military did you serve? I served in the Marine Corps and I served in the Army. Did you enlist or did you were you drafted? I enlisted. What were you what were your initial thoughts going in? Well, you never know what's coming, right? You hear about it, and you know that it's going to kind of be a little bit of a shocker. It's not like when you walk through going home and you walk through and everything's fine and hunky dory. You're going there with a bunch of people, and you know they're going to yell at you, and you know they're going to make you do things, right? And a lot of these things are going to be kind of painful, like push ups and running and sit ups. So, you kind of uh, don't anticipate being very happy at first, right? Why did you choose to enlist? Why did I choose to enlist? Well, I chose to to make a life for my son and because it was something that I always wanted to do. Even when I was your age, I wanted to be part of the military and I wanted to serve and serve my country. Did you always want to, to enlist or join the military? I did. Yeah, ever since I was, you know, I was playing, they used to have these toys called G.I. Joe, you know, back when we were little. You can still find them somewhere, but ever since that day, I was out in the woods, I was digging foxholes with a shovel, uh, playing war. I always wanted to be in the military. Why did you choose the branch of the military that you did? Well, I chose two branches. And the reason I chose the Marine Corps is because they are considered one of the most difficult for everybody involved, not for specialized. Every branch of service has got their own tough jobs, right? But the Marine Corps, it seems like every job is tough because you're a Marine first. And it's very prestigious. And I liked their traditions. They had a long tradition, a lot of good military history. And I wanted to be a part of that. When I got out of the Marine Corps, I wanted to do certain jobs. I wanted to be a criminal investigator and go into military police work. And it just so happened when I moved to another state for a little bit of time that there was a unit there in the Army Reserves. And it was right after 9-11 happened. I'd gotten out of the military. A few months later, 9-11 happened. And I said, you know what? It's time to go back in. we got some more serving to do for my country. What a... What was experience at basic training? Well, 
you get the basic training and you fly into the airport. Now I went to basic training in San Diego, California. Great weather, right? It's really nice. Except when you're doing, you know, hundreds of push-ups a day. Doesn't really matter about the weather. So you get there, you get off the plane, and they put you on a bus. And they make you put your head down. And then normally, what it took about an hour and a half, two hours to get there on the bus. When you get off the bus, you see that the airport, you can see the airport like about 100 feet away. So what they do is, is to, so it kind of disorientate you, right? So it only took about five minutes to actually get there. But they drive you around an hour and a half and your head's down. So you don't know where you're going. And that, there's a reason behind all that. Then you get there and you're getting yelled at a lot. And they had these footprints that were painted out on the ground. And they were just yellow footprints. And everybody had to get off and they had to stand like you would. They called the position of attention where your feet, your heels are together at a 45 degree angle. You haven't really learned that yet, but these footprints are designed for that. So everybody gets off the bus and they have to stand on these footprints. And while you're doing that, there's some gentlemen uh, known as drill instructors that are walking through yelling at everybody to get their anxiety up okay now there's a certain reason for everything to do like that but that was the initial welcome to boot camp did you make friends I made a lot of friends I still have some of those friends that I keep in contact with to this day do you write any, did you write any letters? I wrote a lot of letters because that's, in boot camp, that's the only way that you can correspond. Well, you were getting, in 12 weeks, you were getting two phone calls that could last a minute or two. So then I was calling my parents and, you know, on these two phone calls. But that's all you got. So typically, if you wanted to talk to anybody back home, you had to actually write a letter. And they would write you back. So you actually had to, you didn't have any email didn't have a cell phone then so you had to wait a while so if it was something important that you really wanted to know about you had to wait until you got the next letter so that and that could take anywhere from days to a week to get how long were you at um, boot camp i spent 12 weeks at boot camp it ended up being 13 weeks because they don't count the first week the first week you just step off the bus and you're getting all your equipment you're getting all your uniforms but you haven't actually started training yet so i spent about 13 weeks there what was like a typical day like almost like morning well a typical day is is you were up pretty much before the sun came up and your drill instructors woke you up and you had like three drill instructors okay there's what is called a senior drill instructor he takes he's kind of like your dad is he'll punish you when you need to be punished or yell at you but most of the time he's there as a mentor and try to help you through things so that's the role that he takes then you have what then you have to what we refer to them as green belts it's the color of the belts are wearing now they're like older brothers so they're there to help you and coach you through things but how they do it is they're going to yell at you a lot and you're going to see, it's going to kind of seem like they're being mean but they're really not it's actually all designed and what it's supposed to teach you and it puts you in difficult situations so you know if you get in that situation in the future that you can survive it and overcome it and that's what their jobs are did you receive specialized training? If so, what was it? I did. I became a special agent or a criminal investigator. How well did you adapt to military life? I, I adapted uh, very well. I liked it. Um, the food was good, especially when I was deployed. When we were back on a base, the food was great. Um, they provide you some place to live. And but some of the best things about it is is your neighbors to the left and the right of you, you know them. Or even if you didn't know them, you got to know them because they did the exact same thing you did. So you had a common bond. Everybody you were around were, was kind of just like you. You all had something to, to talk about, right? You all had something to do, and you all had shared a similar experience. So you immediately had a connection. With the 
physical regimen, barracks, food, social life, etc. Like, what was it? What was it? Well, usually, you know, with the physical regimen, you usually would work out, or as a unit, at least three to four times a week. And usually it was around five or six in the morning that you would all get together and, and you'd go on a run or you would lift weights or you'd push-ups or whatever that may be. But you had it designed out and that was to make sure that you stayed physically fit because in the military you had to stay physically fit to keep, make sure you can do your job well. Especially if you have to go to combat or something to that effect. You've got to make sure you're physically fit. Um, the food was great at times, and at other times, it was not so good. Um, I'm Gavin Swan, and I'll be doing part two of the interview. First question is, where did you serve? Well, I served um, a lot of places. I served, I served in North Carolina, in Georgia, I served in Iraq, and I when I was in the Marines, I was on a ship to where I went everywhere from Puerto Rico all the way through Europe and the Mediterranean. Okay. In your longest period serving, were you stationed in the U.S. or abroad? I was, in my longest period, I was stationed in the U.S. Okay. Um, what was your living situation like? Well, that depended on given the time. Uh, when I was cruising through Europe, I was living on a ship. So I lived in, it's kind of like, imagine bunk beds that are about four high. Um, you didn't have a dresser because your bed became the dresser. So you had to pull out a big shelf and stick all your stuff in there. Your bed became the dresser. So that meant that you can imagine four stacked upon each other and you only had about this much room. There was barely enough room to turn sideways to fit your sh shoulder in there. So, but living on a ship is kind of like getting rocked when you go to sleep. It's kind of like getting rocked so you kind of feel like a baby and you kind of sleep that well because you're laying in there and the ship's naturally rocking, right? So that part was nice. Other times I'd lived in the barracks I've lived in tents, and or I had me had to live off station, which they give you money and you can rent a house or whatever that may be. Did you make friends with the people in your squadron? Oh, uh, I did. I still have many of them, even though it's been years that we still talk to this day, especially through things like Facebook and email. We talk all the time. I see what they're doing with their lives. They can see what I'm doing with my life. We send pictures back and forth and still talk, even though it, it may have been 10 years ago. Um, what were your main hobbies while off duty? Uh, well, I did pretty much some of the same things that we talked about when I was a kid. Um, I typically like to go see whatever sites I was wherever I might be there, or ride four-wheelers, or uh, play paintball, or it, I would go see historic sites, especially if I went someplace new. Especially like if, when I was going through Europe, go to Italy, I saw things like Rome and the cathedral um, all over Italy. And to see all these historic places that a lot of you may have read about in your geography books just like I did when I was in fifth grade that I got to see some of those places physically and take pictures, the Leaning Tower of Pisa, things like that. So I tried to get out to see some of these things that, you know, as students we all sit there and think one day maybe I can actually get to go there. Well, the military helped, helped me go there. Um, now when I was in places like Iraq, when you're off duty, there's not many places you can really run off to if you're not, you know, in, a, in an armored vehicle. So typically would just go to the gym and work out or they would have places you could go watch movies, that kind of thing. How long did you serve overseas? I served altogether overseas. I probably served 
almost two years. That's separate times. Um, how did you correspond with family and friends back home? What types of technology did you have available for communication? Well, when I was in the Marines, like I was on a ship, we would have access to email, and at certain times we were able to use pay phones, and of course you could write letters. Um, when I went to Iraq, uh, I had a cell phone. I was able to email. Um, so, or we, we could actually write letter, but we could still email and send pictures and everything else. Um, were you were you on the front lines where you were stationed at? I was. Um, what types of combat did you witness? Well, um, many different types of combat, of combat, whether that be direct combat or whether it be my job as a criminal investigator, which if we had something that was um, really bad is they may send me there to actually investigate it, you know, kind of like CSI or the FBI. I was that for the military. So I did forensics actually doing what CSI does, but I also did investigations as well. So sometimes there was things that they needed me to go look at or needed me to investigate, so I would have to go there. So I saw many different things. Um, how did you feel about witnessing destruction and casualties? Well, like I said, my job as a criminal investigator during that time, um, sometimes the casualties were very sad um, on both sides because everybody has families. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody at one point was somebody's son or daughter. They have mom and dads. So it could be kind of sad at times. Um, but it can also be very humbling in that it makes you appreciate what you have at home. Um, the destruction, well, that's, that sometimes that's just not a good thing, but it can be unavoidable at times. It's, but what you really focus on when you're in a situation like that is the person to your left and to your right. That's your brothers and that's your sisters. And you're there to protect them. And they're there to protect you. And that's why you do it. Um, now we're going to Reagan for part three of the interview. Hi, I'm Reagan Irvin with part three of the interview. When did you return home? Was it because your time... <clears throat> with the military was up or because the war was over? <clears throat> well, the war wasn't over, so I returned uh, just being that my mission, my assignment, in my time was up. So um, I came home and was serving again, but I was serving again stateside. How did you return home? Oh, I returned home with a plane ride, a 17 hour plane ride. So imagine you've got your back, you're sitting on a plane and you're squished in between other people and you've got your backpack, except your backpack weighs about 75 pounds. Now put your backpack on your lap and then sit in a plane like that for around 17 hours. So it's kind of rough, but hey, you're going home. So it doesn't matter. You don't really care. Now, if you got to get up to go to the bathroom, that's an ordeal. And if you're getting hungry, you, you hope that the stewardess will bring you a snack. But you're going home. How was your homecoming received by family and friends and your community? I was treated very well. At the time, I worked for a company that was a national company. And they put a big banner up where I worked at that they'd all signed. Um, my family and friends threw me a party after I got back, welcomed me home. I was, I was treated very well, which unfortunately some of our veterans in, in war such as Vietnam, they were not treated so well. It was a different climate. So I was treated a lot better than they were. 
How do you how did you readjust to civilian life? Was it easy or difficult? It can be very difficult in that just because you're out of a war zone or out of combat zone physically doesn't mean that mentally that you are. I'm sure you all may have heard of things like PTSD, post-traumatic mm -hmm. stress disorder. Mm -hmm. Myself, a lot of my friends suffer from that, but it's at different but it's at different levels, right? Doesn't mean that you can't still function, you can't still have a normal life, but certain things that normally you wouldn't pay attention to, attention to, when you get over in combat, you start paying attention to everything. So Whereas if you're driving a car down the road and you see something weird on the side of a road, normally you wouldn't pay attention to it, right? But if you're in combat, when they put bombs on the side of the road and they look like trash, they look like this or that, you pay really close attention to it. Or you're looking for little bitty wires run across the road because that may mean that you or your brother or sister to your right or your left, it could jeopardize your life. So you start pay attention to things like that. Some of the other things are, I know for me, is I don't like being in large groups. I just don't feel comfortable in large groups anymore. Um, so typically I like to stay in smaller groups, but the more, the more time goes on, it makes it just a little bit better, and you understand these things, and you learn about these things. Are you a member of any of veterans associations? If so, which? Currently, I am uh, I'm not a member, but I work very closely with them with my job because I work for the Department of Veterans Affairs. So I work with every veteran service organization or a member of them to help take care of our veterans. How long were you in the military? It was about almost 15 years altogether. What have you done since leaving the military? Well, uh, since leaving the military, when I left the reserves in 2012, I continued my job as a police officer. Um, I stayed working as a police officer, and now I am a chief of police for the federal police force that's assigned to protect our Department of Veterans Affairs properties in southern Illinois, part of Indiana, and part of Kentucky. So we cover three states. So what I do is I'm still protecting my fellow veterans. How have your wartime experience affect your life? Well, some experiences are both positive and negative. You see things in a wartime and like I said, it makes you appreciate your life a lot more. You have an understanding of those you're trying to help. Because even in places like Iraq, I saw people that were in such poverty. They didn't have anything. So getting to help them actually get food or help you know, watch or provide security while someone else was getting them electricity, whatever it may be, that makes you feel good about yourself. Some of the other negative things are, is, is like I was telling you about, um, you know, you, you can be kind of on guard. Or sometimes you can even, maybe you're not so close with certain people you used to be close with it because it kind of can affect your personal relationships. But you have to recognize that and push through that and work on relationships. It's just some of the drawbacks that can happen. What are some life lessons you have learned from military service? My best life lessons were learned from the military service. I guess one of the first ones is um, always lead by example. I mean, if you want other people to do something and you're telling them not to do something, make sure you're not doing it yourself. If you want people to act right, then you need to act right yourself. So you want to lead by example, okay? That's what they see. Um, discipline, um, an understanding of others. 
self-sacrifice, knowing that sometimes you may have to put the good of others before yourself. That's some of the most important life lessons that they are. How did you feel about serving your country? Um, I felt very uh, privileged um, for, that I was allowed the opportunity to serve my country and actually the freedoms that we all enjoy that I actually had a part in making sure that we still had those freedoms. So, but like I said, it was a privilege to serve in the military and I'm glad that I had that opportunity. What message would you leave about serving in the military for future generations that may hear this interview? I would say that it's not a commitment to take lightly. It's something that's very serious and that can do, you can do great things with your life. And if you have that calling, because it truly is a calling, then I say you should embrace it and join the military because Everyone in the military is one of the finest caliber people, in my opinion. Before we finish, we would all want to say a sincere thank you for you, Jason, for serving our country. We really appreciate your service. Well, thank you. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, thank Jason. You. Thank you.